Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this uh, afternoon, Israeli time, um, for uh, the new DMG seminar series. This time, we are moving to South Africa, and we are hosting Professor Andrew Green from the School of Agriculture, Earth, and Environmental Sciences at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Um, the title of his talk is Crocodiles to Isis and Everything in Between, the Pitfalls of Marine Geoscience Research in Southeast Africa. So about Andy, Professor Andy Green is a full professor of marine geology and sedimentology at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He received a PhD in marine geology from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in 2009, in which he examined the geological setting of the Coalacant Latimeria Chalumnae's habitat. I'm sorry if I didn't mention it properly. Since then, he has published 85 peer reviewed papers and graduated more than 20 masters and PhD students. He was a Fulbright Fellow in 2018 and the recipient of the American Geophysical Union Africa Award in Ocean Sciences in 2019. His research, his research interests are on shallow submarine geology and sea level change. So, Andrew, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, Nicholas. That's very kind of you. I'm going to just try and get everything up and running here so that I'm going to share the screen. How's that looking? Are you guys able to see that? I'm sure. Good. Okay, let me start. Okay, well, thank you very much for the very kind invitation to share some of the research that we've been doing out of my research units at the university. I must say, Nicholas, that's one of the better pronunciations I've heard of the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, I do chuckle. It's not the easiest thing to pronounce, so thank you very much for that. I decided perhaps to modify my title a tiny bit here, and that's Pitfalls is perhaps somewhat of a negative term, and I think out of many pitfalls, we can oftentimes also draw positives. And also, uh, we do quite a bit of work throughout Africa, so maybe Southeast Africa is a bit of a, a misnomer, so I decided to cross that out as well, and we're going to include some of the work that we do on the West Coast as well. So I'm going to lead you guys through some stories. I'll give you a little bit of background to marine geology in South Africa. So. Marine geology is somewhat like the poor second cousin to the more famous and I think infinitely more respected disciplines of marine biology, oceanography, chemistry. So whenever you actually mention that you're a marine geologist, this is generally the first thing that springs to people's minds, the dolphins and the whales. And it's an unfortunate thing because ultimately this colors many people's perceptions of the discipline. It's not a very big discipline. We'll talk about that now. And Obviously that's wrong and I have to correct people because that's really what we're interested in. We're interested in rocks and sediments and of course the, the driving factors behind how these are shaped on the seabed. But I'd like to set a little bit of context firstly to where I'm from and then to the background to the research that we do in terms of the overall kind of social, economic and political situation. So we have South Africa or Southern Africa and I'm sure everybody knows, get my cursor here, the west coast and there's Cape Town, you were mentioning it just now, but there's actually another city in South Africa, which is just a little bigger than Cape Town, which is Durban, that's my hometown. So we have the west coast and then the east coast, or as I like to refer to it, the right coast. So I'm from Durban, I'm actually originally from Zimbabwe, which is up to the north, landlocked country. I came here when I was about six years old, I've stayed ever since, except for a few sojourns around the globe here and there. And this is where we operate most of our marine geological research out of. We, we focus quite a bit on the East Coast. And then of course, we've been delving now into quite a lot of the geology on the West Coast as well. But to put context to this, marine geology, as I said, is not particularly popular now, but it was a flourishing discipline throughout the 1970s and into the early 1990s, mostly driven by the University of Cape Town. And in this perspective, the guys were focusing in deep water to shelf work, uh, and in conjunction with funding agencies and bodies that were parastatal. So in parastatal basically meaning, meaning they were run by the government. So the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, which is the CSIR, and the Council for Geoscience, which at the time was the Marine, I'm sorry, the Geological Survey of South Africa. 
And a number of very famous people have been associated with that, um, the most prominent being Richard Dingle, who was, the, the, I think, the first professor of that unit, many, many famous papers published. And this spread across to my university on the East Coast, which was at that time the University of Natal, since been renamed. And most of this then re revolved around coastal and estuarine work with some shelf studies. And again, supported mostly by the same funding agencies. The West Coast, perhaps more primarily, primarily driven by oil and gas exploration through an agency known as SUCOR, which is now the Petroleum Agency of South Africa. The East Coast driven more so by the Geological Survey and the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. And everything seemed to be going very well up until about the early 2000s when things began to fall apart and implode. There was a strong commercialization of government entities uh, in the early 2000s. And basically, this withdrew most of the funding and I think the, the fairly carefree and easy attitudes that were, uh, I guess, dominant at the time towards marine geology and marine geological research. So when I've looked, and I've looked quite carefully at the institutions in Africa that deal with marine geoscience, there's really not many. So Nigeria, Kenya, and Tanzania outside of South Africa have institutions, but most of these are, it's really the status is uncertain. Nigeria, certainly with their oil and gas, there's, there's a lot of papers out of there, but whether Nigerians are involved or whether they're being educated in that to the fullest extent is not clear. Um, so within South Africa, those are the two main places. Uh, the University of Cape Town, which is historically the powerhouse in marine geology, has now since uh, dropped all of its marine geology. It's focusing now on ancient marine geochemistry. So this is basically Archean age stuff and hard rock Gondwanan sedimentology. The University of the Western Cape does some marine geology, but it's mostly petroleum exploration. And so what we're looking at now ultimately is one institution that is really driving most of the marine geological research now in the country and on the continent. And that is my university and my small little research unit. So where we are at present, we have a number of projects and collaborations. So the red spots are the research projects, and you can see we have quite a few of those throughout Africa. And I'm quite proud to say as well, uh, collaborations and research going on throughout other places in the world as well. So people aren't just coming to us, we're going to them as well. But I think is a really, really um, healthy indicator of the status of the research that we're doing. So that's a bit of context to where we are and kind of what's driving things at present. Let's talk now about extra pitfalls. So there's pitfalls in terms of no one really knows who we are. There's pitfalls in terms of there just really being one institution. So, you know, where do we go from there? And I think some of the best pitfalls are, are those which are completely and utterly driven by a local circumstance. And let's start on the West Coast. So we do a lot of work with De Beers, which is one of the, obviously the, the principal diamond mining company in the world, and in particular NAMDEV, which is a Namibian government and De Beers partnership. So there's a lot of work done there, and most of the work is done in an area called the Schwergebiet. So Schwergebiet translates to the Forbidden Zone, and I'll show you exactly why. There we have the Forbidden Zone and all its majesty. This is one of the most highly energetic environments on Earth in terms of wave energy. This is the type of oceanographic conditions that we're going to go out and survey and sample the seabed. Um, there's no harbors in the area in which we work, so it really becomes quite a challenging place to, to actually mobilize and to operate in. For perspective, out of the 365 and a quarter days of the year, there are at best 14 days that you can work at sea in this area. How do we work at sea in this area? Well, there you go, there's our fantastic research vessel. So we don't have the floating hotels that most people are, I guess, familiar with. We work with very small craft. Um, so we do sea launches, as you can see, tied to a tractor, pushed out to sea, very, very precarious. There's the back of the vessel, there's a dual head multi-beam there, and on there you can see the blue cable, that's, that's a seismic um, acquisition system as well. And this is basically how you operate in an environment where you can end up with some of the biggest swells pounding those shores. What is produced is really quite unusually good though, if you think you're facing all of these uh, major pitfalls. So here's a bedrock model that's been produced for this area stemming all the way north from the Orange River, which is the boundary or the, the border between South Africa and Namibia up north. So you're looking at about 50 to 60 kilometers along shore length. And we want to know more about the bedrock because obviously the bedrock is the focus site in which we track diamonds. 
if we look at it very carefully, on top of this bedrock too, we have all of these crazy looking seismic reflectors that are being superimposed on there. And this is in itself very interesting. So here we have a very nice seismic line, get good quality data, which is how we managed to build this bedrock model. That's a 50 meter line spacing, over 50 to 60 kilometers. So you can imagine over the 14 days that you get to do this type of work, it's a lot of um, blood, sweat and tears. You come out in the morning early and you come back late at night. You can't be out all day. What do these reflectors mean? Well, these are submerged barrier spits and gravel deposits that are identical to these sorts of features that we find on land. So these are the, these are the raised features from sea level highs. And these are the cores that we take through these barrier, barrier spits and gravel spits. These are very well known to be diamondiferous. In fact, these are the first mining targets that were um, targeted or focused on by De Beers in the area. And we find the exact same material sitting offshore. And when we log these cores, we look at these cores, it's not uncommon to find small diamonds here and there. The thing about this though, is that in order to have access to even touch a piece of the sediment, you need to have your police record checked. You need to be x-rayed in and out of the labs. And it's really quite a big deal. Uh, <laughs> you're not going to be walking out with a diamond, that's for sure. But there's diamonds in there, and that's what we're finding. Beautiful seismic work. The life of mine, so we talk of mining, we talk of how long mine can sustain itself. It was originally four years, and after the work that's been done in conjunction with the doctoral students of mine, the life of mine has now been extended to 30 years based on the various seismic um, charts and pictures that we managed to make of the seabed in the area. From a bathymetry perspective, We've got quite good coverage considering all we can really do are a few lines every, um, every year. So we've really tried very hard to get as much coverage as possible. And I just want to drink, draw your attention to this little area over here. Interestingly, that seabed has a series of bed forms on there. Only type of bed forms I've seen in the literature are those from the passage of Hurricane Sandy on the New Jersey shelf, leaving behind these odd ball-like features. What we think they are aren't exactly bed forms, but rather mud balls that have been pumped out from flood episodes of the Orange River that have been laying on the seabed. And they tend to be semi-permanent features. So we have two different surveys on the right here. This was uh, dry season, this is wet season. And we find that basically where these mud balls are, these are areas of no accumulation. And around them, we end up having deposition and infilling. This is rather unusual because mud to persist in an environment is energetic. As the one here and has been well documented you can move cobbles and boulders from the longshore drift for mud to persist is rather unusual so we're busy looking at that from the perspective of how this is going to impact mining because you dredge up the diamonds and obviously dredging up massive chunks of cohesive mud is going to play a bit of a, a game when it comes to the dredging capabilities so really interesting and i think make a nice paper in something like marine geology at some point down the line so again, some, some positives out of the pitfalls, that's for sure. Now, if we move to the, to the East Coast, so here's my hometown, or the town I live in, this is Durban, down here is East London, which is the second biggest coastal town on the way down from Durban all the way through to Cape Town on the West Coast. Some of this bathymetry is bathymetry we've collected, other is no bathymetry that I've reprocessed and managed to kind of stitch together. And I'd like to draw you guys' attention to some of the areas over here that we've been working. So this area is known as the Wild Coast. It's a, it's a massive graveyard of many, many ships. The reason being is you have a very, very strong current that flows along the coast here, a geostrophic current called the Gullis Current. And when we have winds that blow over these huge distances from the Antarctic out of the southwesterly, we produce mammoth waves. And these waves tend to destroy most things that are sailing in that area. If we look at the general wave distribution, it's not particularly aggressive if you look at it have a, a sort of a modal wave height of about two meters, and that's all year long. It's very rare that you have less than that. But what we do is we have these fairly large events that occur all the way out here, up to about nine meters specific wave, significant wave height. And between those, we find that there's just nowhere to hide. So as soon as you get above two meters, there's no, there's no ports, there's nowhere you can anchor. And here's our magnificent research vessel. It's basically a ski boat. We hire it from some of the commercial fishermen that go out uh, game fishing. And this is the kind of thing that helps us to produce these sorts of maps. So there's a good map. Sorry, I don't have a scale of the North Area. I've been down a mine for the last, I don't know how long, so I haven't managed to polish this up as nicely as I would have. But here's a map showing basic a seafloor coverage for a strip of area 
offshore of a, a place called Port St. John's on the, the southeast coast of South Africa. Quite a good coverage. That's about 50 kilometers of, of relatively decent seafloor coverage out to the shelf edge. We've made some good interpretations. So that's my students' work there. But what I'd like to draw your attention to, always get these things blocking stuff, is from the multi-beam data, we can see very nicely here, we've got a, a fluvial system. Some of the seismics reveals that as well with an inlet. We can see over here these strange features. These are aeolianites so, um, and beach rocks, so coastal deposits that are lithified. You can see a set of what appears to be recurved and prograding spits. And then in here, we have remnants of flood tide deltas that are preserved. To keep in mind, this is quite an important area. This is at about 60 meters water depth. Keep that in mind for the rest of the talk. It's quite an important zone when we talk about submerged shorelines along the Southeast African coast. And that's a really good example right there, an inlet spits, flood tide deltas, we're approximating sea level roughly. Okay, so that's some of the work that we're doing offshore, and we'll go back to offshore work as we move further north, but we also like to work within the coastal water bodies of Southeast Africa. And we're really interested in the evolution from lakes through to estuaries and rivers. So depending on sea level states, how these things are behaving, how they link up to the shelf, etc. Sounds great. So this is Lake St. Lucia here in perspective. So Lake St. Lucia is Africa's biggest functioning estuary. It's a World Heritage Site. Um, it's a full conservation area. You have to have massive amounts of permission to get onto the place and to work. We've had a series of research projects that have been examining both Lake St. Lucia all the way north. What we find here is typically it's not the most hospitable place to be working. Anything has a connection to the ocean in South Africa, you can guarantee you're going to have sharks swimming in there. There's crocodiles and there's hippos. So the hippopotamus is the second, and if we include man, it will be the third most dangerous animal in South Africa. In Africa. The most dangerous probably being the mosquito right over here. And it's again one of these areas that during wet days, it's a malarial, so during the wet season, it's a malarial area as well. So it's, it's mostly inhospitable to go work there. What is it like from the perspective of science? Well. These are the main focal points, sorry, I'll go back to that. It's just full of mud. And I, that's why I prefer the marine geophysics side of things. I don't get quite as muddy. There's nothing, nothing more uh, disheartening than going out for a full day in the field and coming back. Maybe your skin looks really nice at the end of it, but you just really do get coated. These are the main areas that we focus on. This is Lake St. Lucia here, the largest estuary in Africa. This is Lake Sabaya, the largest freshwater lake in South Africa. And this is Cozy Bay. Up the top here, the border of Mozambique, this is the most pristine estuary in Southern Africa. So how do we actually go about answering the questions of what makes a lake bed? And again, I think you're gonna laugh at some of the things that we use. This is our research vessel, pray we don't capsize. Basically that has the full seismic array that uh, trails off the back here. There's a 6.5 kVA generator underneath this tarpaulin in case you get splashed. You will get splashed in the lake. It's got a, a fetch of about 40 kilometers. So then when the wind blows, there tends to be breaking waves in there. So it's quite scary. Here's our other research vessel, we call it Walks on Water because my colleague from the University of Advances Rand drives that thing like a, like a lunatic. This is our sunburn station over here where we are basically attacked by horseflies and get um, third degree sunburn. This is the work that we do, we take cores, Everyone gets very muddy, and mostly we're very grateful for this. We exploit the cheap labor that students provide. So, if students are listening here, you are appreciated, but do don't be fooled. You are definitely a commodity, but a, an appreciated commodity. This is one of my most favorite images. So, this is a seismic line that I collected through one of these lakes. These lakes are only about a meter deep, so that's a pretty reasonable seismic line using a boomer system. We don't have fancy trip systems. They don't work well in, our, in South Africa anyway. The materials that we're looking at are just, I don't think, lend themselves well to using a chair. So we're using a boomer here, and I've got some really good data, but I'd like to draw your attention to this um, hyperbolic bow tie type reflector here. That's really special to me. So many of you are familiar with the hippopotamus, and the hippopotamus is pretty much something that most of you think of as these cute little pink fluffy creatures, where in actual fact, they are extremely aggressive and dangerous. There's one trying to beat another one with its baby. Uh, I'm not sure quite what's going on there, but that's the kind of thing that hippos do. 
And what you're seeing over here is, in effect, the very first seismic imaging of a hippopotamus. So that is a hippopotamus seismic fasces. At first, I thought I'd gone over a log or a big rock or something in the seabed, turned around, and I just noticed this hippo pop up between the streamer and the source. You can imagine that's the boat that we're on. And we tried as quickly as we could to disappear into the sunset. I'll be honest, this thing chased us for about 100 meters or so. It actually made a bow wave. It was running so fast in the seabed, and it was keeping pace with us. We were scared. So that's the kind of thing that happens on a fairly regular basis. There's no health and safety here. Um, no one cares what you do as long as you don't damage any wildlife. So um, it's the kind of thing that probably would horrify uh, the older members of staff, but intrigue the younger students in terms of coming for a visit to South Africa. So what do our results show us? Well, we stuck mostly between a rock and a, and a dry place. This whole system and many of these systems are very much underlain by bedrock. There's very little sediment in them. There's not much accommodation to store large volumes of water, even though this is a monstrous estuary. It's really big. What we find is that when we core in these areas and we look at the geomorphological evolution of these over time, we show in our cores the development of many, many horizons of halite. So you guys will probably be familiar with this. Halite, of course, is related to desiccation events. We look at the seismics, these things line up with very strong erosional reflectors. And what it points to is that Africa's largest estuary that is being managed come hell or high water, it must stay the same. The status quo actually has dried out due to fluctuations in El Nino about four or five times in the last 2,000 years, which I think is a really intriguing result when we start to come and try and add our inputs to the marine biologist inputs. And as I said to you, we're not considered the most prominent nor the most intelligent of marine scientists. Let's move further afield now. Another aspect that we like to look at are the tropical marine environments of Mozambique. A lot of this is based on research projects relating to liquid natural gas from the main gas fields offshore of Mozambique, as well as some of our um, interest in terms of archeological remnants. This used to be a big shipping, shipping site for spices as well as slaves. And you know, there's a lot of interesting things that can be found on the seabed. So let's have a look at this, and we're going to frame it within the context of ISIS. These are the areas that we've been investigating from south all the way right up to the, the Tanzanian border to the north. And as you well know, those northern areas, or well, you may well know, have lately been um, dominated by insurgents affiliated with ISIS. So here's our sonar engineer cradling an AK-47. <laughs> so that's the vessel we work off. This very vessel, we were working in um, Mozambique Island, and then in the adjoining embayment, which is an embayment called Masimba de Praia, it has left, and there were a few bullet holes in that vessel. I couldn't find any pictures. I just took a few pot shots at them as they were leaving. It's kind of crazy to think that there's your sonar engineer. He's looking very relaxed, holding himself an AK-47. I didn't go on that trip, but I really, really wish I had. I'd love to have just tried out one of those, you know, just for the fun, the fun of it. So what are the results? Well, we actually get really good data here. Um, even using those strange little vessels, the, the sea conditions are great. Unfortunately, the political situation is not so great. So here's one of the bathymetry maps that we've made from Mozambique Island. Um, we were gonna go in and tidy this up. Every one of those is also a seismic profile. So we've got relatively dense seismic grid through the area too. We find some really cool sea level indicators here. Um, we find low stand deltas at the shelf edge, paleo coastline sitting at about 120 meters below present, which corresponds with our last glacial maximum. We've got river valleys that are still preserved that haven't been infilled, reaching out to these areas, uh, actually feeding these little deltas. You can map this out perfectly with the seismic geometry. We find, again, cliff edges, those sorts of things occurring at about a 60 meter depth. And if you remember back to the, 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 the inlet and the deltas that I showed you earlier, it's the same depth. So we've got a very long distance between these things along the coasts, and we're seeing very similar sea level indicators. This is a little bit more difficult to date, unfortunately. If we go to Masimba de Praia, which is the adjoining abatements, this is pretty cool in that we find in seismics a whole series of these progradational sediment bodies that are capped off. They sit at about 15 meters water depth. So that's absolute water depth relative to mean sea level. They sit there and they've just been completely drowned by sort of modern estuarine, central embayment, central embayment, central fill type of materials within this tide-dominated environment. 
we have a look here too. It's pretty cool. There's all sorts of things I was hoping, and I hope that some of the guys that are interested in gas are here because there's all sorts of beach rock pinnacles, not only that, but also a variety of marine derived, um, methane derived orthogenic carbonates. We were going to go back and study these. So you can actually see our preliminary soundings here. It took us ages because this is really, really shallow. You can see coming into almost just under a meter here. In the area, we've done some mapping of all of the various bodies. We were hoping to go back and sample. Unfortunately, this was the final trip that we did to northern Mozambique. This was the one in which there were a couple of bullet holes. I'd gone home after this one, and basically the guy sailed out, and the guys were taking shots at them. So until the situation calms down, and I think in particular when the LNG pipelines go back on into, like, I guess, the survey mode, we won't be returning, which is such a pity. So what is this all for? Well, I'm particularly interested in global sea level. Global sea level, particularly where we are in Southern Africa, it's a far field site. Um, there's no ice, there's no isostatic rebound from that perspective. The GIA for the area is relatively um, conservative compared to what's been modeled. So you, you generally within a half a meter to maybe 90 centimeters of what the, the model GIA, GIA is, at least for the, the post-glacial transgression from the last glacial maximum. So it's this period that we're quite intrigued in, in particular, this line over here. So this is our previous sea level curve made by some very famous scientists, that one, both of whom have, have taught me so much. But it's not very well constrained, as you can see. And so that's what we've been trying to do, is to better constrain that sea level curve. The reason being is that that sea level curve holds the key to climate and catastrophe. There's massive jumps in sea level associated with major collapses in the ice sheets. Those result in meltwater pulses. And we find that there are very good stratigraphic and geomorphological indicators of these meltwater pulses. And we feel that these are good parallels and alternatives to the general coral-based records with Acropora and those types of corals, because we know, I've seen some things presented at the EGU where Acropora has been found to grow 100 meters below the sea surface. So it can be a somewhat dubious, not that it necessarily is always that, but you know, there is some doubt. Most people probably wouldn't share that doubt, but I think that Having an alternative to this is really cool. So it's this really that I'm interested in. And this is the Western Pacific. Is that right? Sorry, let's go look at my camera. Yeah. And we can see the stepped rise in sea level coming from the LGM up. And we're interested now in looking at the Indian Ocean. You'll be interested to know the Indian Ocean is the least studied of any of the ocean basins on Earth. Very little is known about sea level variation in there, maybe a little from our Australian counterparts. But there's nothing really going on for Southeast Africa or Southwest Africa. So everything that we've been looking at actually corresponds somewhat with these various jumps in sea level. So this is our newly constrained sea level curve. And we, we're hoping to provide this geomorphological alternative to what we're seeing on, you know, in coral records across the globe and those sorts of things. It's not an area, as you see, and we've spoken about, the wave energy is such that it tends to preclude you know, muddy layers being deposited, uh, things get broken up, so shells, those sorts of things are oftentimes not whole. It's a very difficult environment in which to constrain this, but we've been doing the very best we can basing things on geophysics, um, hydrography, so multi-beam bathymetry, and coring, dredging, grabbing, scuba diving, whatever we can to get those samples. So here's a good example of what we would consider a 60 meter shoreline, here's another one. So this is sitting almost directly offshore of Durban survey this in and you can see very clearly here we've got a shoreline that looks exactly like a headland with a log spiral bay over there we see a little underfilled in size valley out here we've sampled this both in the, the back, back um, environment the back barrier environment here as well as on the shoreline and that comes in at about a younger driest age of I think it's about 11,600 to 11,800 years before present if we look at some of the unconsolidated things, and the consolidated ones, sorry, to just backtrack, they are important because in South Africa, we have the subtropical, subtropical climates. We form beach rocks in the earlier nights within uh, spaces of five years to maybe 75 years. So very, very quick, a snapshot in time, very good in terms of sea level indicators. If we look at some of the unconsolidated sediments, here we have a submerged delta, a big lobe of a submerged delta that we've managed to drill. We've got our data now. The drilling reveals that this thing, we presume this might be the case. This thing sits around about here. We, 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 we recognize the slow stand, so a very still or perhaps slowly rising sea level. 
at about minus 30 meters, coming in at about, I think it's 8,000 years, or sorry, 8,500 years. And this has been preserved with some sort of rapid jump in sea level, likewise this one. If we look in some of these embayments now, and some of the coastal lakes, we find submerged deltaic bodies, but these are not actual proper river deltas, these are bayhead deltas. Again, we can see these things backstepping. And these things are pretty cool because, again, we can date various materials in there, and it looks as if we have signals for meltwater pulse 1C and meltwater pulse 1D. This is great because we have the full assemblage of these things, but without much isostatic rebound or um, departure from the GIA models. So we feel that we're actually starting to piece together a very good geomorphological alternative to some of the other seabed or um, you know, coral-based proxies that people like to use. So let's have a look again. Let's circle back to the pitfalls, because I think those are all excellent possibilities that are emerging. It's taught us to be quite reliable and, and uh, like on, in terms of our own resources and resourceful. So let's go from my experience of being on the water from, from best to worst. So definitely the best is generally the floating hotels. So this is the Norwegian research vessel that comes and does fishery science. I managed to get time on that for about three days. So I did a whole whack of multi-beaming and uh, some, some nice, high, very high resolution seismic work. Of course, we have the German Meteor, which again is probably just one step down from that, another hotel. And then we have the Great Dividing Line. Everything else that comes after this is basically a floating tetanus risk. So this used to be the University of Cape Town's former research vessel. They sold it off because they just couldn't afford to keep it. It was bought for 200,000 Rand. And so if you give you an idea, Rand, it's 15 Rand to the US dollar, 200,000 Rand, and it had its tanks full, 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 full to the brim with fuel. That was how it was bought and it was operated as a commercial vessel. We hired this thing many, many times for our various surveys. Those are great surveys. You're not so likely to catch tetanus of this one. We get onto the South African actual governmental owned vessels. This one's okay, I guess. It rolls around a bit, a bit seismic -y, noisy. You can do multi beam of it. <sighs> South Africa doesn't really have a deep water multi beam though. So it's a bit of a moot point from that side of things. We've been in a submersible. That was quite nice, I must say. Um, probably a little bit less comfortable than going on the, the Algoa, the previous vessel I showed you. This was for my PhD. So we're looking for the coelacanth, which is a fossil fish, a, a living fossil. They were found in offshore of um, northern KwaZulu-Natal, which is the province I'm in. That was where we looked for it. So I was fortunate enough to go on a dive. That was quite nice, I must admit, even though the guy that piloted this kept asking for a kiss for the pilot from the girls. And this is me during my PhD, looking somewhat girl-like. I was a little offended that he didn't ask for a kiss from me. This is the kind of thing that we do <laughs> all the time. So this is the Maverick. It's horrible. You end up with carbon monoxide poisoning from the generator at the back there. Your fingernails go white. You can see our Buma system sitting on the back ready to go. This is another one. So I showed you this one. So at one point, the vessel was making too much noise. So we decided we'd tow it with another rubber duck. So this is our extra long seismic array. Don't be jealous. This is the kind of thing that we've done in terms of trying to tow our cores, our cora, and get to core sites in some of our coastal water bodies. It's unsteerable. You can't actually steer it at all. Basically, when the wind blows, you just let it blow you to whatever core site you hope it, that you eventually end up at. Very scientific, I know. And I'm sure that given our National Research Foundation's precarious position, and who knows what's going to happen with our political situation, this is our research vessel NRF budget cut. <laughs> Hopefully we don't get to that point in time. Um, I'm just very glad to say that I'm working a lot with industry, so most of this doesn't apply nowadays. You know, we have, uh, I think, a far better fleet of vessels to work off. So that brings it up to, I think, my very last slide here, which is, this is still my preferred research vessel. I, I fell in love with the ocean. Um, the Indian Ocean is a wonderful place. It's warm, it's inviting, it's hospitable. Yes, you do end up with things such as hippopotamus in there, but they're generally restricted to the wildlife areas. Um, but mostly, it's just a wonderful place to be. I love the ocean. It's been um, my passion since the moment I first saw it. And I'm very grateful to have been given this opportunity to build a career around that. And especially, you know, to build a career where I can get to reach out and to speak to people on the other side of the world and to show them a little bit about the things that make it fun. So, Pitfalls, yes, but they're actually quite fun pitfalls apart from being shy at. And I would encourage you guys to come visit, to reach out, to build connections, because I think there's a lot of cool things that can be done between 
many different institutions and partnerships. So with that, I'm not sure what my time is like. I'd like to just say a thank you to the following people. I don't think you guys need to, need to go through that, but definitely thank you to the tetanus vaccination and also to my wife. I've tricked her into going on a holiday where she's ended up on that coring barge. And I promise you every fight that we have at home that gets brought up. But most importantly, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and for the invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Andy. It was really awesome. Um, I personally really enjoyed um, the, your talk. It reminds me also of some of the vessels that I have been surveying, especially the low cut of them. Um, okay, so I open, I open the podium for, um, for questions for the people. Um, so since I don't see uh, all of you, just uh, get in and interrupt. And just I have, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Yes, um, I'm I'm a oceanography student, so my question is from an oceanographer point of view. Um, I had the opportunity to sample actually in the Agolas, and I remember that in the TS diagrams we can find and place um, water whose origin were from from way up current from the Red Sea and further on. And I'd like to know if if you can if you have managed to place um, thanks to your proximity to the Agolas current sediment that has um, come from many different countries from from further up north and uh, if you can identify where the sediment has come from um, by certain characteristics. That's that's a great question. Um, so yes, we have done provenance studies. So this was done in conjunction with some of my, my German colleagues and one of our uh, um, more recent uh, collaborations. So we've done a lot of coring and the guys have then also sampled a lot of the river catchments all the way through into southern Mozambique. And it's interesting is a lot of what you see is not so much brought in from uh, very distal areas. A lot of the, the sediment provenance is quite proximal. So it comes out of uh, the, the catchment locally, which is extremely, extremely close to the coast. So our coastal gradient up to our escarpment is about as steep as it is in South America on the, you know, the convergent margin side. It's extremely, extremely steep. They have all of these little narrow cross flowing rivers and they tend to overprint, I imagine most of the sediment that is drawn down from very far upstream with the Gullis current. So we have very strong mineral assemblages, heavy minerals in particular, and that's what we were using to fingerprint most things. And the heavies mostly derive out of the, the flood basalts that cover or cap the escarpment in South Africa, some of the metamorphic belts there. But we haven't managed to pick up anything as far north. What's, what's quite interesting is when you work on the shelf, the Gullis current isn't exactly this unidirectional feature. You find that you have bed load partings and those results, or, or they relate to things such as um, coastal offsets, that sort of thing. So you actually do compartmentalize your sediment. So it's not necessary to this long stream of sediments that's being brought down. But without a doubt, yes, you do find assemblages up to about, I would say, where the Limpopo rivers and that complex drains in, in southern, southern Mozambique. But nothing as far afield as, as I think the Red Sea, which is a pity. That would be pretty cool. Thank you. Cool. Somebody else has a question? Uh, can I ask another question? Please go ahead. Um, just notice that I, on the like on the map you can see that the the shelf coming out of Southeast Africa is quite large, um, and so there's a there's a relatively shallow to the ocean floor. Do you um, you also measure seismic activity in in that area um, regarding the um, tectonic activity. Sorry, yeah, Tom, I, I might have might have missed that. Do, do we measure the, the sort of the seismic activity in the area? Is that right? Boy, not an earshot, but I'm not from the team, boy. I think you did. Uh, I'm I'm talking more about uh, like tectonic activity. Can you measure any? Um, Sorry, from please. like the south, s the southwestern Indian Ridge, or uh, any movement that you can feel. 
so those those areas are perhaps a little a little deep um, from my my research field. You know, they, they, they're quite out in, in, in the what we call the Natal Valley. Uh, there's certainly evidence for tectonic activity out there. So you know, you can look at where all the major earthquake epicenters are. And in particular, we, we did a paper many years back with a, a doctoral student of mine. I, I became a deep water marine geologist for a little while. And there were all these unusual mounds we found on the seabed there. And those mounds correlate very much in terms of their size to some of the um, volcanic plugs that track their way up <coughs> towards the East African Rift. What we postulated indeed was that you were having an opening, seaward opening of the rift, and you were getting some volcanism out there, and that clustered perfectly along the, the line of, of, of greater seismicity. From the sort of the more recent seismicity, uh, there's definitely stuff that's, that's observable. So there are the occasional earthquakes. And we find in some of our incised valley fills, when we look in seismic, we can actually see material that is definitely Holocene in age, and more than likely less than a few thousand years, 2,000 years or so, and you can see these things offset by normal faults. So there's definite seismic activity, and, and basically one of the towns north of us, it's an industrial town called Richards Bay, uh, some of the GPS work is looking as if that is slowly moving out towards the northeast, and Durban is moving towards the southwest as you're going to start to form that ocean basin, you know, going up all the way through Tanzania into Ethiopia. And if that is the case, we will rejoice because we tend to mock the people from Richards Bay. It's, it's a hectic industrial town. We all have a good laugh about that. But yeah, definitely a bit of seismicity going on, but nothing compared to, you know, the more seismically active areas. We still, I think, are quite stable cryptonic ground. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, somebody else has a question? Maybe the people in class want to ask a question? Uh, no, we don't have any questions, sorry. Okay. That's, that's um, a classic, classic students, Nicholas, classic students. So I'm here now with the whole group. And you know, when they do have questions, they just whisper quietly. And you're like, I'm not Santa Claus. I can't hear your whispers around the world. So I don't, don't worry, I know students never ask questions. Well, depending apparently from which country. I heard that there are some countries that they don't stop asking questions. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could import those students. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a question. How the hell you entered with the seismic equipment to Namibia? I mean, and did that and into a forbidden area because I know that it's absolutely forbidden to be there. So, uh, and I mean, so, how you did you know, it? <laughs> so the only way that could have been done, and it is completely, it's a, it's so my entire life and career, I think has been a series of very lucky events. Lucky, we, we, we escaped Zimbabwe as re refugees to South Africa. And that was where I got to get a, a decent education. Lucky that I'd been given a, a, some seismic equipment from Ulster University, like given, and because we had nothing, no, no equipment whatsoever. There was not a single piece of scientific research equipment in the whole country to do this. And they gave that to me in about 2012. In 2013, a former student of mine had gone to work for De Beers and they were battling to visualize the, we, they call it the football. So it's that bedrock surface. They just couldn't see it. And they tried hiring in chirps and topazes and all of the, the fancy stuff that you see everywhere. And I had this good old boomer system. And I'd said, you know, we were having a beer. He'd come to, come to say hello. And I got to chat in with him. I hadn't seen him in ages. And again, I connected with him on Facebook. I couldn't find this guy. And we got to chatting. And I said, look, why don't you take my equipment? And you can use it. So it went under the, the auspices of a commercial project. You know, where it was like a two-way street. So I use my equipment, and if you see anything cool, we can use the data for research. That started a, a little partnership that then grew because the equipment worked really well. And then it suddenly wasn't a test anymore. Now it was we're going to do 400 meter line spacing. And I've got a PhD student who started, who was a geophysicist at De Beers. And that went, and she pushed more and more. So then it went to 200, then to 100, then to 50 meters. When that started happening, then it suddenly became apparent that we could do this. And then we started to plan around getting better bathymetry and to use that small vessel. And so all of that really is just pure luck. 
the right place at the right time with the right bits of equipment that finally worked. And, you know, that's how, how it's been done. De Beers or Namdeb will import the equipment in. They have their own equipment now, but we, we tend to help them out with other bits and pieces. Of, you know, and it's a very nice reciprocal relationship. But it was just luck, absolutely luck. So uh, from that project in Namibia, um, they got the information they needed at the end, and so and you could was, publish it. <laughs> yes. So that was the one thing that they, they, they were very amenable to. So as long as we weren't reporting on diamond grades or anything that's sort of industry um, specific, it wasn't an issue at all. So. You know, we fed, it was a very good project because we fed back to the industry. Um, so, you know, they increased their life of mine by six times, which is unprecedented. It was, I mean, I'm so happy about that. So the life of mine went to 30 years. Um, we find a whole lot of unexplored resources that we, we think can, you know, with increased technological, um, like mining, mining technologies, those should be easily extracted. And then, you know, from our side, we've had fourth year students, so the undergrad students, we've had master's students working there, we have internships. So I have an Italian student, strangely, who came on an Erasmus um, fellowship. So he's with me now and I've sent him off for nine months. So he's been turning um, in Cape Town and then he'll be going to see a few times. And he's, he's basically processing up all new bathymetry that's been collected and, and reprocessing old blocks that don't quite fit together. So, you know, we've gotten, massive mileage out of this just for students student training because my aim is really to try and grow marine geoscience here it's very very much when i started as a phd student it was all but dead it was so stagnant and so you know it's 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 starting to, to bloom again and we, we're kind of hoping that we'll start to put people into positions and this is the way in which i see it happening well fantastic <laughs> it seems that you have succeeded very good so far <laughs> I hope so. And you're swimming in South African water. <laughs> it's just too much fun though. You know, Nicholas, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's very re rewarding. You know, every seismic line is something we never knew. Every little bit of multi-beam is a piece of seafloor that no one had an idea about. It, it, it's so underrepresented relative to what we know of the, the oceanography and the biology. And, you know, slowly people are starting to change their mindsets, which I think is great. So we have geologists now that are sitting on the national biodiversity planning and those sorts of things. And it's changing. And I, I think as long as it can change and we can still have fun, that's going to be the best thing ever. Absolutely. It's a good way of thinking. Uh, well, if nobody else have a question, I think that uh, that's it for now. In any case, we are, we are in time. Um, so again, thank you, Andy. Would you like to be still in our mailing list for um, for um, uh, the future seminars that we have? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will take care of that. And um, well, I don't remember which one is the next, but I think that we are going to Europe, I think. But you will receive a mail, everybody. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you very much again, Andy. It was really enlightening and to everybody to have participated. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.